because it's like right now people are throwing their apple cores over the fence in their neighbor's yard. And that's not free enterprise. Mm -hmm. That's just trashing your neighbor. Well, we're trashing the planet. And so we have to have the economy pick up that price signal. Hello, and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. This Populist Dialogues cablecast program's purpose is to advance the mission of the Alliance for Democracy to create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. I'm your host, David Delk. Today, our guests are Tamara Staten and Phil Carver. Tamara is a mother, experienced teacher, and up-and-coming community organizer. She led the formation of the Portland chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby last year and served as event coordinator for the 2011 Portland Moving Planet event. She builds community in her neighborhood through potlucks, disaster preparedness, and asset management uh, mapping. She has a passion to inspire and support others on the positive impacts they have or they can have on the earth. Phil Carver is an energy policy, policy analyst and utility economist, currently working as senior policy analyst for the director of the Oregon Department of Energy. As part of the 350.org organization, Phil walked 350 miles to Coo from Coos Bay, Oregon to Astoria, Oregon, then on to Portland to meet people concerned about the impact of climate change on the Oregon coast. So welcome to the show, Tamara. Thank you. Phil? Thanks. Great, good. So uh, let's start with you, Tamara. Okay. Tell us about how you went from being a mother and a teacher to being an, an organizer. Yeah, that's, um, thanks, that's a good question. So, um, well, I would say that I, you know, I started with um, the 350 event, Moving Planet, a couple years ago as a, as a leadership prog project for a, for, a, for a program that I was doing. And, um, and I felt so empowered that I could make a difference in Portland that I wanted to take it further. And the other thing that I wanted to do is I wanted to make more of a difference than just a day. I mean, a lot of people came to that event. Merkley spoke at the event. Um, and then we all left. Mm -hmm. And then what? And so I wanted to do something that would be able to have an ongoing effect that would be able to educate and empower and inspire. And so a friend of mine um, told me about Citizens Climate Lobby. And so I um, checked it out, looked at the slideshow, got on the uh, on the intro call and was really impressed and what I what I really loved is well I can get into more about what I loved I would say in a few minutes but um, actually I'm gonna go with that yeah. I, what I yeah, loved is that it just seemed like um, not only a grassroots um, movement where we're they're empowering and educating people like me who maybe don't know very much but um, it's a top-down legislation affecting the people who um, either don't know about climate change or don't um, have it within them to do anything about it or are still in denial phase, um, it can affect a lot of society. And I really think that for the place that we're at right now, to having this kind of beautiful melding of, of the two approaches is really important. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah. And you mentioned 350.org. Yeah. Can you just talk for a minute about what 350.org oh, yeah. is? So 350.org is, is a, um, an international organization started by Bill McKibben, and um, their, one of their missions, at least, is to educate people about um, what 350 is, which is the safe level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for humans, for life, actually. And um, we're right now, we're at 400. Okay. Um, and so they're, right now, 350.org is working on divestment from fossil fuel companies. And um, it's a huge, huge, very um, successful nonprofit organization. It's, I'm really impressed with mm -hmm. it. Yeah, right. And, and they, they work nationally. Nationally uh, and internationally, I would say. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, uh, so w when you learned about... Uh, is it a uh, cl climate change lo uh, lobby? Citizens Climate Lobby, Citizens yeah. Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh -huh. I knew I would get that wrong. That's okay, no problem. Because <laughs> I've always seen the initials and CCL. just filled in the yeah. words myself and yeah, did yeah. it wrong. So That's okay. Uh, uh, how long have they existed and where are they at and how large are they? Yeah. So um, we started around f at five years ago um, and we've been doubling every year for the past five years. Um, we're a national um, nonprofit nonpartisan organization. We have 102 chapters in North America 
and um, that would be United States and Canada. And um, we have five chapters in Oregon. So Portland, Eugene, Corvallis, Medford, Bend, and soon to be Salem, right? Oh, okay. Phil? Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, Phil, you're going you're gonna to uh, head up the Salem, Salem operation? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, with several other of my friends, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, great. Um, and what the, the mission of uh, CCL, I'll just mm -hmm. use yeah, the initials, <laughs> uh, is to? Is to, um, number one, build the political will for, for a livable world or a stable climate. Um, and what that means is basically um, getting people like us to let the politicians know that what we want. Um, because politicians respond to political will. They, they don't create it. So um, it's basically empowering people like us, um, you know, those of us who are teachers and mothers and maybe don't know as much about politics, and people like Phil, um, who as an economist, knows a lot more about um, politics and economics, economics than we do, um, empowering us to have personal and political breakthroughs in our, in our um, well, period, breakthroughs, yeah, I would say. Uh -huh. um, and so we do this mostly through building relationships. We, do, we build relationships with members of Congress through meetings, um, through handwritten letters, and um, we build relationships with um, editorial boards. So we've met, met with the Oregonian, for example, twice. Um, as, an, as a Portland chapter, that uh -huh. is. And um, we write letters to the editor, and so that's one way of building the political will, is the members of Congress, and this is something that I've learned in the last year and a half, is that the members of Congress, they open the newspapers of their, where their constituents are, and they, they read, what, what do my constituents want? Mm -hmm. um, and so the, you know, we, try to get, we could try to get published and mm -hmm. build relationships okay. in that way. Okay. Um. Talk talk about uh, you went to a conference recently mm -hmm. in Washington yeah. D.C. Yeah. Th talk about your experience there. Yeah. Well, you saw my face light up. It was definitely <laughs> um, it was the first time I'd ever been to D.C. Um, and it was really amazing for me to be there. Um, I mean, I played tourist for about three hours, um, and the rest of my time I was in the halls of Capitol Hill and. Um, had you ever been there before? No, never, never been there. there. Mm -hmm. um, definitely never been there to lobby. And um, so there were, it was our national conference for Citizens Climate Lobby. Um, I think last year we had 125 volunteers pay their own way to go there. This year we had um, th over 360 volunteers. Um, and we met with 435 members of Congress or their staff in four days. Uh -huh. So it was really, really powerful. And for me, I was in 10 meetings um, in two days. And so it was, you know, finish one meeting yeah. and all right, look at my map and <laughs> go under the tunnels. And, and it was really, uh -huh. um, for me, it was such a powerful experience to just come away with this, um, not only a really new understanding for me as a mother and um, as a language teacher, not knowing a ton about politics, to come away with a really clear understanding of, of government mm -hmm. um, and you know what it means for these members of Congress to work together and what it means for them to, to meet with us as constituents. And I didn't even know what a constituent was last year. Oh. I didn't know how many members of wow. Congress we had or senators. And so for me to be there and not only learn this stuff, but to come away with this empowered feeling of they, they open their doors to us. They want to hear what we have to say. And yes, it took a lot of um, persistence and consistency for us to be able to get those meetings with mm -hmm. those staff and with those members of Congress. But when we had them, they gave us their attention for 15 minutes or 30 minutes and uh -huh. listened to what we wanted. And um, in many events, um, in many circumstances, told us we're on the same side. You know, even the even staunch Republicans, we agree we want this too. Mm -hmm. um, we just have to figure out a way to make it work. And so for me, what I came away with is um, while a lot of people think and say that politicians can be two-faced, what I see it as is there are a number of, you know, there, we live in a, you know, on a planet and a nation with all walks of life. Um, some people who, you know, want this and that and from liberals to conservatives and with Texans, for, you know, with we, I met with um, not just Oregonians, but I met with um, a senator from Texas. Mm -hmm. So she can't just go back to, to Texas, a known Republican, very conservative state, and say, okay, guys, we're going to have a carbon tax. <laughs> you know, She's definitely going to lose. And in fact, Bob Inglis, 
um, lost after six years of running for, for bringing up climate change mm -hmm. and saying, you know, this is something that's really important. And so I just have a whole new um, level of hope and um, excitement and understanding around, around politics after okay. being in D.C. Great. Good. Yeah. And what I have, what you bring to me is a new level of hope that more and more people who haven't been involved with this kind of process before can get involved and can make a difference. So that's the hope you bring to me. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, yeah. great. Yeah. So talk about, you went and met with these folks. What was your message to them? Um, you, either one of you. Yeah. <laughs> well, do we, do we do yeah, that? go ahead, okay. please. Yeah. The, um, the idea is that the, we really need to turn the whole economy to a low carbon economy. And you can't do that with just programs or incentives or subsidies or regulation. We really need something that will drive the economy. And price is what drives the economy. And so we need a price on carbon. And if we can get that price on carbon a number of ways, but this proposal is very simple. It's a upfront, upstream tax on carbon. We call it a fee and dividend because it, the tax money all goes back to people. So it doesn't enlarge the government. And so it's way upstream. It's very easy. There's like five or 600 entities that would pay the tax. And then the cost of the carbon would flow through the economy. So everything you'd buy from gasoline to tinker toys <laughs> would have the carbon cost, the cost of the damage that we're doing to the environment incorporated in the price. And that would drive everything we do. And the economy and the market is very efficient if it has the right price signal. But if it has the wrong price signal, it goes very fast in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really um, important that the economy get this signal. And this, this proposal, 100% of the money is redistributed back to households, either through the IRS or Social Security or some other kind of organization. Again, very low administrative cost. Mm -hmm. We've done this with rebate checks for stimulus um, things back in the Bush administration. And two-thirds of the households would get more money back than they pay out in higher prices for energy products and goods. And uh, the people who would get more money back are the people who have a low carbon footprint. And everybody would be encouraged to lower their carbon footprint. So the, um, it's, it doesn't enlarge government so that principled conservatives should support this. Because it's like right now people are throwing their apple cores over the fence in their neighbor's yard. And that's not free enterprise. Mm -hmm. That's just trashing your neighbor. Or we're trashing the planet. And so we have to have the economy pick up that price signal. And it leaves individual choices to individuals and businesses of how best to manage their carbon. There's, it doesn't increase regulations. There may be some regulations that are needed, but it'll, it'll mostly reduce the need for regulations. And it'll reduce the need for subsidizing low carbon resources. So on a budget perspective, this will eliminate the government trying to pick low carbon winners. And that'll reduce the federal budget deficit. Mm -hmm. and, the, and in addition to the political advantage of a, the 100% rebate, it actually makes the program more administratable. Because the carbon dioxide tax is not a source of revenue, the carbon dioxide tax can be raised or lowered over time to get the right amount of carbon out of the economy. And so it would start out with 10 years of locked in prices. And it would be it'd start out with something like $15 per ton of carbon dioxide, which is about 17 cents per gallon of gasoline. It would ramp up to about $100 per ton of carbon dioxide which is about $1.15 per gallon of gasoline in about 10 years. And then we'd see how we're doing. And if we need more push on this to get to 80% reduction by 2050, then we could raise the tax. It, and it would all go back to households. And if we're doing better than we expected, say PVs have a breakthrough, photovoltaic solar cells have a breakthrough, then we could keep that tax at that $100 level or even start to lower it as we see the economy turn around. But we really need to, to get back to 350 parts per million. We need to really start cranking now. We've no, the science has been solid for 20 years. And right now, 97% of climate scientists, that is people who actually publish in scientific journals, remember publish or perish, the academics need yeah. to publish. Those uh -huh. are the real journals they have to publish, uh -huh. not a popular journal. And 97% of those scientists agree that humans are causing the planet to warm. Climate change is happening now, and it's serious. And so we passed 350 back in 88. And now we see that we, we thought 400 or even 450 would be okay back then. Mm -hmm. But now we see we really need to get back to 350 based on new climatology studies of um, ancient climates that are um, buried in sediments and ice cores. And we really 
see that it's going to be a very, very difficult planet um, if we don't do something pretty quick in the next three to five years or seven years at the most. I think we really need to have major policy changes in D.C. and then implemented by the states and local governments and businesses and households. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, that, that time frame that you just indicated uh, seems really, really short uh, before um, policy to get changed in Washington, D.C. and for people to embrace it. It's a really a short time frame. But you're saying that that's really what we have to do. Yes. And you hope that we do it. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. it, it's pretty clear now that we're going to see a two degree centigrade rise in the average surface temperatures of the Earth. And just to give you a comparison, the depths of the ice ages were only about five degrees centigrade colder than we are now. So this is a huge change. And people sometimes say, well, you know, change, we might like it better. Well, change is almost always bad because we're a just civilization that is adjusted to the climate we have. So if sea level rises, well, that floods cities. But if sea level fell, that would turn all the harbors in the world into mud flats. Mm -hmm. So we can't move cities that fast. So it's the rate of change that is so staggering. So this climate change is the most challenging thing that society is going to face in the 21st century by far. Mm -hmm. And it's going to make all the other challenges we face worse. Mm -hmm. So the, the passage is clearly very urgent to get this done and to get it done right. Yes. Right. And to okay. do it in a way that doesn't, I mean, even he, there are a lot of people, and even there's a there's a part of me that when I hear that, it's like, oh my god, I'm like, that's too scary. Like, w I just can't I can't deal with yeah, that. Uh -huh. And so having to work with with there are a lot of people in despair. Um, that's that's a pretty common stage for people to be at right now. There's denial and there's despair. And so how do we get how to get past the despair and into the place where we can take action because we don't have a ton of time to to spend in despair anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and my, my going to the conference, too, in D.C., I came away totally energized. And mm -hmm. really, the antidote to despair is to get active. Uh, yes. And really, it, oh. it makes me feel a lot better. I've been working on this professionally for 25 years. And that didn't really give me the boost that mm -hmm. working for Citizens Climate Lobby. They're just a very effective oh. organization. They, they're transformational, both at the personal level, what people think they can't do, they find they can, and, and at the societal level. And we're having really interesting conversations with conservatives you know, the libertarians are actually getting on board with this. They can see that the economy doesn't function without the right price signals. And this doesn't grow government. So there's actually a real chance for a political compromise. Yeah. And it's not a compromise. It's really win-win. It really reduces the size of government, and it gets the economy on a track for a sustainable climate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to do a, to, to do a, a cap and dividend program, uh, does that require... Uh, or does it facilitate getting rid of all the subsidies that we now currently pay for fossil fuels? Um, many of them could go away, like the wind production tax credit could go away. You're talking about cap. Yeah. You're talking yeah. about fee and dividend, yeah. carbon tax, yes. right? Not uh, cap right. and trade. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. Right. I can talk if you right. want later about cap and trade. Why that floundered yes. in Congress uh, in 2009? Yes, but it. Um, some things will need. To, federal government still need to do basic primary research. Without basic primary research, there really isn't the technologies. But it's the private sector that has to develop the technologies. And so things like production tax credits and subsidies for sequestered coal and nuclear power and um, solar subsidies to get them out in the marketplace, those aren't needed anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and But there are regulations, and transportation is a more difficult sector. We have to have fueling stations for electricity or or natural gas, those don't just pop up naturally because of the chicken and egg problem. Uh -huh. I, w I was really thinking of the subsidies we now give to the fossil fuel industry mm -hmm. to extract mm -hmm. all those fossil fuels out of the earth. Uh, would, uh, would a cap and dividend program end those subsidies or would they just continue? Well, they should have been eliminated a long time ago. Y yes, uh, right. And so it, yeah. it takes the political will to get those kind of subsidies eliminated. Th those are yeah. things that we need to lobby about as well as, the, so as, as a carbon tax. Now, this is not a cap and trade program. That was a thing where they were proposed in um, the Waxman-Markey bill back in 2008 that passed the House and almost passed the Senate. And that was really very, very complicated. And what made it super complicated is they're giving away allowances to emit carbon dioxide. And so you're basically um, rewarding the people who are the big emitters, the big companies. And the idea was that would just grease the wheels and, you know, kind of, you know, low money to 
give to people so they'd all get on board. And they didn't get on board, and it turned out to be really unworkable as a long-term strategy. So it's better just to put the carbon price into the economy, do it as a tax or a fee, and then have that money flow back to households. And there may be programs that are needed to help, like miners in West Virginia. They'll definitely be put out of a job. But this will create more jobs in energy efficiency and renewables than it eliminate in the fossil fuel industry. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a job producer. Way mm -hmm. more jobs. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess I, I, you know, that kind of brings up a question in my mind is if, while it may produce a lot more jobs, will it produce more jobs for the folks that lose them? specifically in West Virginia? Are the jobs going to be created there where they actually live? There, the manufacturing of these things can be anywhere. And so um, we're talking about manufacturing wind turbines, solar cells, um, in insulation, um, controls for commercial buildings. There's a lot of things to be manufactured. So there need to be training programs so people can learn how to make these things, design these things. Um, the, the West is really blessed with a, a just a massive amount of renewable resources. We start out with hydro, and now we're developing wind resources, but solar, geothermal, and even potentially wave and um, tidal and current technologies. So Oregon's really going to benefit quite a bit economically from this. Uh -huh. And so we'll have to understand and take care of the people who are need help. Yeah. yeah. So you would you would put this tax on uh, where the where the fossil fuel production actually happens, where the mines are and where the, at the where the drills are. Okay. Yeah, and at the border. Oh, mm -hmm. And at the border, okay, which mm -hmm. was exactly what my question mm -hmm. was going to be, is I, I, we import so much uh, energy, uh, fossil fuel energy, how do you account for, uh, how do you put that into the equation? Yeah, it, it's basically counting up the carbon atoms in the fuel, because um, every carbon atom in the fuel, whether it's oil, coal, or natural gas, becomes an atom of, or a molecule of carbon dioxide. So it's, it's just simple chemistry. There are some adjustments, really dirty fuels at the border that cause a lot of emissions to produce, like the, um, the tar sands out of Canada. Those would have more uh, higher carbon tax than just the, the molecules themselves, the number of carbon atoms would apply. But it's pretty simple to administer. There mm -hmm. would just be basically a border tax adjustment so that it would be fair mm -hmm. on playing field. Okay, it yeah. Level the playing field. yeah. And the um, important as aspect of this is that if another country doesn't have a carbon pricing system of some type, then the, the United States would impose a tariff at the border to make it a fair competition. And that's allowed under the World Trade Organization Agreement. And it gives a strong incentive for that country to collect the tax themselves, rather than have that be a tax on their products that would be collected by the government and then rebated to American consumers. Okay. So it, it's really, it, it's a way to break through the morass of current ne international mm -hmm. negotiations. Y yeah, and actually you're like anticipating my, <laughs> my, <laughs> my <laughs> you know, what I see as problems. And one of them was that, you know, if you have tariffs and so forth, does that uh, run into uh, uh, objections from uh, trade agreements, uh, you know, like NAFTA or CAFTA or Obama is ne currently negotiating the Pacific um, Trans-Pacific mm -hmm. Partnership. And yeah. How does that affect all that? So um, you're saying that this is kind of already pre-approved for, at least through the WTO. Right. Aspect it, of it, it, it's, it's definitely understood. So I think it has a chance to really start with bilateral negotiations. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, but with us in China starting. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, we've got uh, just a few minutes left. So... Uh, why don't you talk about when you have meetings and how people actually get involved with yeah. this movement? Yeah, so we, um, we meet monthly. Um, generally, we meet every first Saturday of the month. Our next meeting um, after the airing of this show would be September 7th, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and the simplest way to get involved is to go to citizensclimatelobby.org. And um, there you can register for an introductory conference call. So every Wednesday at 5 o'clock, we have an introductory conference call. Mark Reynolds, um, the executive director, gives about a 45-minute to an hour-long overview of how we got started and that kind of thing. So people can call that um, number. They can, uh, I think the number will be on the screen after the show. And, um, and um, you know, we're, we're growing in Portland, but we're always looking for more. And we are actually looking for... Um, chapters in every congressional district in the United States um, and in um, in Canada. They're not called con gre congressional uh, yeah. districts <laughs> there, but Wyoming, Idaho, Connecticut, Delaware, Indiana, Louisiana, 
Mississippi, Nevada, North Dakota, West Virginia, and Hawaii are the places we're actively looking to, to grow chapters. Okay. So, so people know of relatives or friends in those areas, they can have to have them start a chapter, and that can make a really big impact, because you really have to get two-thirds of the Senate to vote for this. Right, yeah. yeah. And what, what's involved with uh, getting a chapter? It's, yeah, yeah, I started the chapter about a year and a half ago, and it um, you just round up about 15 to 20 people who have some level of interest, and then somebody will come out and do a group start. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, all right, mm -hmm. good. All right, well, Tamara, thank you yeah, very much for being you. here. thank you. Philip, thank you for thank joining you, us. Okay, good. Our guests today have been Tamara Staten and Phil Carver. They're both with CCL, Citizens Climate Lobby. Learn more about Citizens Climate Lobby at citizensclimatelobby.org. Click on Carbon Tax to learn more specifics on the carbon fee and dividend proposal. If you do live in the Portland area and want to get to work on the carbon fee and dividend or otherwise advocate on the issue of climate crisis, please attend a Portland Citizens Climate Lobby meeting on September 7th. Email them at portlandccl at gmail.com or check their website for details at facebook.com slash Portland Citizens Climate Lobby. Don't forget that you can watch Populous Dialogues on YouTube. Go to youtube.com slash Populous Dialogues to view most of our past shows. And when you're there, Click the subscribe button so that when a new program is uploaded, you will automatically receive an email notice. If you are watching on YouTube, you can help us expand our viewership. Contact your local cable access station and see what is required for you to sponsor a weekly broadcast of our program. Most local stations are looking for good material and will welcome the, the, the suggestion. Populous Dialogues is a project of the Portland Alliance for Democracy. Learn more about us at afd-pdx.org and about our national organization at thealliancefordemocracy.org. We want to thank our volunteers who donate their time to get our program on the air. So thank you to Roger Bates, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas. And to all of you watching, thank you. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye.